Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day to you. I am Dr. Gaurav Agnihotri and today I am going to give a talk on the submandibular salivary gland. Well, we have three types of salivary glands, the parotid, sublingual and submandibular and today we are going to focus on the submandibular salivary gland. Their names indicate their position. Parotid means around the ear, so the parotid gland is located in relation to the ear. Submandibular is related in relation to the mandible as the name indicates submandibular it is underneath the mandible. So this is the gland which we are going to focus on today and the third is the sublingual as the name indicates below the tongue. So this uh, almond shaped gland sublingual gland is present below the tongue in the anterior part. So the three salivary glands are there, their secretion is there, they are responsible for the saliva in our mouth keeping the mouth wet and today we are going to go through the gross anatomy of the submandibular salivary gland and the clinical manifestations associated with this gland we are trying to, to go and comprehend. So the submandibular salivary gland accounts for 80% of all salivary duct calculi, stones or sialoliths. So submandibular salivary gland is notorious for having stones associated with it. And there is a reason for this. The reason is that the secretion of the mucus acini is viscous in, the, in nature. So it facilitates the formation of stone formation. And the other thing is that the submandibular salivary duct also moves upwards for some distance. And uh, due to this, its anti-gravity motion and the viscous nature of the secretion, it is predisposed to stone formation. Tumors may also take place as far as this gland is concerned and so it is uh, uh, if the tumors of the submandibular gland are there then uh, they have to be treated accordingly. Infection of the submandibular gland is referred to as sialadenitis and uh, even while uh, removing the submandibular salivary gland one has to take care uh, as we see in the figure below not to damage the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. So the incision has to be there 2.5 centimeter below the lower border of mandible. At least that level has to be maintained to prevent damage to the mandib marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. So coming to the gross anatomy of the submandibular salivary gland now. Situation and extent of the submandibular salivary gland. It is a large salivary gland situated in the anterior part of the digastric triangle. So the digastric triangle, anterior belly of digastric, posterior belly of digastric. So this is round about the location of my submandibular salivary gland. My index finger is representing the anterior belly of digastric, thumb is representing the posterior belly of digastric. So in the digastric, digastric triangle, just below the level of the mandible, this is the location of the submandibular salivary gland. It is about the size of a walnut. So if we take a horizontal section through this region that is depicted in the figure on the left hand side, now it is J shaped and uh, the mylohyde muscle, it is indenting it so that the upper part is the superficial part of the gland and the thumb is representing the deep part of the gland. Mylohyde muscle, it is important to note that the mylohyde muscles of the two sides, they unite to form a diaphragm in the floor of the mouth. So this gland is J shaped and it is indented by the posterior border of mylohyde muscle as shown in the figure. A is the superficial part of the gland, C is the deep part of the gland and the mylohyde muscle is not labeled here, it is indenting uh, the gland. AD refers to anterior belly of digastric. B is the sublingual gland, GH is the geniohyoid, GG is the genioglossus and HG is the hyoglossus muscle. So situation and 
uh, extent of the gland are described in this slide. Now coming to the superficial part of the gland, this part fills the digastric triangle and has three surfaces. The three surfaces are inferior, medial and lateral surfaces. Now we can make out the superficial part of the submandibular salivary gland in the diagram here and uh, uh, we can make out that uh, D is the deep fascia, deep cervical fascia and the superficial cervical fascia is lying inferiorly. The red portion is the mandible and uh, so this superficial part fills the digastric triangle. It has got inferior, medial and lateral surfaces. The gland is partially enclosed between two layers of deep cervical fascia. Superficial layer of fascia covers inferior surface of gland and is attached to base of mandible while the deep layer covers medial surface of gland and is attached to the mylohyde line of the mandible. We can see that D that is getting attached to the mandible, the red part and the line of uh, the point of attachment is to the mylohyde line. Now relations of the superficial part, relations of the inferior surface, inferior surface is related to skin, platysma, cervical branch of facial nerve, deep fascia, facial vein and the submandibular lymph nodes. So here we can make out the deep fascia marked by B on the inferior aspect. It is the superficial layer of the deep fascia and we can also make out A which is the facial vein. MP represents the medial pterygoid muscle while M represents the masseter muscle here in the figure. Now again lateral surface relations. The lateral surface is related to the submandibular fossa on the mandible and here we can find out the insertion of the, uh, we can uh, make out the insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle and we can also make out the facial artery which is forming the lateral relation of the superficial part of the submandibular salivary gland. Now if you look at C in the figure, C is the deep part of the submandibular salivary gland. It is small in size, it lies deep to the mylohyoid and superficial to the hyoglossus and styloglossus muscles. Posteriorly it is continuous with the superficial part around the posterior border of mylohyoid. So as I told you before this is a horizontal section in the submandibular region. So the mylohyoid muscle is, is uh, in the, the posterior border of mylohyoid muscle is indenting the gland so that it has got a superficial part and it has got a deep part. So anteriorly the deep part extends to the posterior end of the sublingual gland. Now here B is the almond sized sublingual gland. So this horizontal section of the submandibular region is so showing A superficial part of submandibular gland, C which is the deep part of submandibular gland and B which is the sublingual gland. Now if we talk of the submandibular duct, it is thin walled about 5 centimeters long. So submandibular duct is 5 cm long, it contains the viscous secretion of mucus acini. Now submandibular salivary gland is a mixed gland, so its uh, secretion is partly serous, partly mucus and the mucus component is viscous in nature and uh, this duct emerges at the anterior end of deep part of the submandibular gland. We can make this out in the figure and uh, runs forwards on the hyoglossus. Uh, between lingual and hypoglossal nerves. Now the opening of this duct is important. It opens on the floor of the mouth on the summit of sublingual papilla at the side of frenulum of the tongue. So the opening is at the sides of frenulum of the tongue at the summit of the sublingual papilla. Now this gland is supplied by the facial artery which is making up the arterial, compo arterial component of supply to the gland. The veins drain into the common facial or the lingual vein while the lymph nodes pass to the submandibular group of lymph nodes. So here SMG refers to the submandibular gland, GG is the genioglossus muscle and uh, this blood supply and lymphatic drainage of the submandibular gland one should know so that a comprehension can be done regarding the activity of the submandibular salivary gland. Now nerve supply of the salivary gland, the gland is supplied by branches from the, from the submandibular ganglion. So submandibular ganglion is there, it is lying on the hyoglossus muscle. 
Now the secretomotor pathway as you can make out in the figure, it begins from the superior salivatory nucleus marked by the red spot on the left side. So it's arising, the fibers are arising from the superior salivatory nucleus, then they are passing through the sensory root of facial nerve, then they are going to the geniculate ganglion, then they are going further and ultimately you know the fibers, the secretomotor fibers are entering the submandibular ganglion, they relay in the ganglion and then postganglionic fibers are going to come out from the ganglion to supply the submandibular gland. Sensory fibers are derived from lingual nerve while the sympathetic fibers are derived from the plexus around the facial artery. Now once again I am now going into the detail of the secretomotor nerve supply. The preganglionic fibers pass through superior salivatory nucleus, sensory root of facial nerve, geniculate ganglion, facial nerve, corda tympani, lingual nerve to reach the submandibular ganglion. These fibers relay in the ganglion and postganglionic fibers emerge from the ganglion to enter the submandibular salivary gland. So these two nerves are related to the submandibular uh, ganglion. This uh, one is uh, the corda tympani branch of facial nerve which has got a functional relationship with the submandibular ganglion while uh, the lingual nerve has got a topical, uh, topographical relation with the uh, submandibular ganglion. Sublingual salivary gland is the smallest salivary gland. It is almond shaped. It is marked by B in the figure. It weighs around 3 to 4 grams. It lies medial to the sublingual fossa of the mandible and lateral to the genioglossus muscle. It has around 15 ducts which, which emerge from the gland. Most of them open directly into the floor of the mouth on the summit of the sublingual fold. A few of them join the submandibular duct. So this gland also receives its blood supply from lingual and submental arteries. The nerve supply is similar to that of the submandibular salivary gland. Here in the figure A is representing the superficial part of the submandibular salivary gland, C is representing the deep part of the submandibular salivary gland, B is representing the sublingual gland, AD refers to the anterior belly of digastric, GH refers to the geniohyoid muscle, GG refers to the genioglossus muscle while HG stand refers to the hyoglossus muscle. Now submandibular ganglion is a peripheral parasympathetic ganglion. It is a relay station for secretomotor fibers to the submandibular gland and sublingual glands. As I mentioned before, topographically it is related to the sublingual nerve but functionally it is connected to the corda tympani branch of facial nerve. It is a fusiform ganglion lying on the hyoglossus muscle just above the deep part of the submandibular salivary gland suspended from the lingual nerve by two roots. So in the figure we can make out that uh, how the preganglionic fibers they are coming in and relaying into the ganglion they are marked by the uh, red line. So one can make out how the preganglionic fibers are relaying in the ganglion and postganglionic fibers are emerging from the ganglion to supply the submandibular salivary gland. Those fibers which are meant to supply the sublingual salivary gland, they re-enter the anterior root of the lingual nerve and you can see the red line there going to the sublingual salivary gland. The sympathetic component is by the plexus of nerves around the facial artery. You can see it by the green line here. These fibers pass without relay and they supply the submandibular salivary gland and they also supply the sublingual salivary gland. The ganglion is shown by the dotted outline here in the figure and uh, one can also then make out the uh, lingual nerve as it is passing through the ganglion. This, this lingual nerve carries the sensory fibers. Now we come to, once again we come to the motor component, motor or parasympathetic fibers pass from lingual nerve to ganglion through posterior root. These are preganglionic fibers that arise in the superior salivatory nucleus and pass through facial nerve, corda tympani and lingual nerve to reach the ganglion. The fibers relay in the ganglion. Postganglionic fibers for submandibular gland reach the gland through five or six branches from this fusiform ganglion. Postganglionic fibers for sublingual and anterior lingual nerves re-enter lingual nerve through anterior root and travel to gland through the distal part of the lingual nerve. So lingual nerve is the topical 
uh, topographical relation to the submandibular ganglion while functionally the sub submandibular ganglion is related to corda tympani branch of facial nerve. The sympathetic fibers one can make out in green, I told you earlier also, they are derived from the plexus around the facial artery. It contains postganglionic fibers arising in the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. They pass through submandibular ganglion without relay and supply vasomotor fibers to submandibular and sublingual glands. Sensory fibers, they reach the ganglion through the lingual nerve and they pass without relay. So, there are three components in the nerve supply to the submandibular salivary gland. Now, regarding the clinical aspects of the submandibular salivary gland, whenever the excision is needed to be done for stone or tumor, one has to be careful not to damage the marginal mandibular branch of facial nerve. Now, this uh, figure on the left hand side is showing the pathological submandibular salivary gland. So, a tumor in this case is there and you can see that the line of incision is marked by this blue line uh, indicated by 3. So, one has to be careful that at least 2.5 centimeter below the angle of the ma mandible, the cut should be given so as to preserve the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. So, this is an important uh, clinical aspect which should be kept in mind while performing the surgeries of this region. Now, another aspect uh, which is important is that the corda tympani, uh, it supplies secretomotor fibers to the submandibular and sublingual salivary gland and it lies medial to the spine of sphenoid. So, the corda tympani has got a medial relation to the spine of sphenoid, while the auriculotemporal nerve which supplies secretomotor fibers to the parotid gland is lying on the lateral aspect of spine of sphenoid. So, spine of sphenoid on its medial side lies the corda tympani which is supplying the submandibular gland and on its lateral side lies the auriculotemporal nerve which is supplying the parotid gland. So, this any injury to the spine of sphenoid may involve both these nerves and this can lead to loss of secretion from all the three salivary glands. So, if there is a damage to the spine of sphenoid then it, since its medial relation is the corda tympani nerve and lateral relation is the auriculotemporal nerve corda tympani nerve supplies submandibular salivary gland while auricular temporal nerve supplies parotid gland. So, damage to spine of sphenoid may lead to loss of secretion from all the three salivary glands. Now, this figure here is showing a stone in the submandibular duct region and uh, this uh, why the stones are more common in the submandibular salivary gland that needs to be underst understood. The stones are more common in the submandibular salivary gland due to the nature of the secretion which is more viscous. So, I read from this slide, histologically parotid consists of serous acini whereas submandibular consists of serous as well as mucous acini. So, submandibular gland is a mixed salivary gland. So, secretion of submandibular gland is more viscous leading to greater occurrence of calculi. The calculus may occur within the gland or its duct and again the passage of the secretion which is more viscous in this case due to its mucoid nature is through a duct. This, that duct passes in an upwards direction. So, that also predisposes uh, the direction of the duct also is a predisposing factor for stone formation and stones are very common in case of the submandibular salivary gland and uh, in some cases even the stones may be visible to the naked eye on opening the mouth. The duct of the submandibular gland is called the Wharton's duct. Now, this duct can be palpated, this duct is uh, being shown in the figure uh, on the left hand side, this duct can be palpated bimanually in the floor of the mouth and can even be seen if it is sufficiently large. The submandibular duct arises from the deep part of the submandibular salivary gland and runs forwards beneath the mucosa of the floor of mouth along the side of the tongue to open on the summit of the sublingual papilla at the side of the frenulum of the tongue. Hence, it can be palpated bimanually and can be seen even if it is sufficiently large through the thin mucous membrane. So, these are the clinical aspects which one has to keep in mind uh, 
while uh, studying the submandibular salivary gland and uh, the anatomical relationships of the submandibular salivary gland should be uh, kept in mind while performing the surgeries of this region. So till the next time we meet again, this is Dr. Gaurav signing off. Thank you, regards, bye and namaste.